more I think about it, I do feel like Godzilla vs. Biolanti is similar to One Piece, where it is almost about breaking free of the shadow of your parent, because that's almost what it feels like Biolanti's story is, where you have Erika dying and then literally being remade by her father into this thing. And then at the end of the movie, Biolanti is almost able to exist in space as this just blooming flower, <laughs> you know, I guess existing happily. It's interesting you put it like that. To me, I felt like Dr. Shiragami was really caught in the shadow of his daughter at that point. The actor that plays Dr. Shiragami does such a great job of just really looking like this haunted dude. He looks unhappy. He Whatever enjoyment for life he has was taken from him the moment Erica died. And in an attempt to get his daughter back, just this desperate attempt, he ends up creating something that's potentially more dangerous to the world than Godzilla. In the end, I think it's a matter that he ended up getting too caught in the shadow of his daughter and trying to go and revive her. And that is what ends up bringing him to his tragic end. You could look at it that way if you want to look at it as a story about a man who cannot let something go. And so he can't let go of his daughter. So he creates this ungodly monster. One of the oldest stories in the book there, isn't it? Even though I do feel like Godzilla is the villain of the story. Godzilla kills way more people than Biolanti. Godzilla kills Colonel Gondo, who I think is the best character in this movie. And then he kills an entire city of people. Biolanti just kills that one terrorist. Well, she does go and attack the JSDF forces there too when she shows up in her enormous monster form. That is true. If Godzilla hadn't caused that situation, she wouldn't have killed those soldiers. That's a good point. Yeah, I could definitely swing with that. There is a certain quality to it where it feels like, all right, she has to go and find some way to go and stop Godzilla from attacking her homeland in that regard. Though I don't see Godzilla necessarily as the villain. He's treated very much like how he is in 1985 or Return of Godzilla, whatever you want to call it. He's treated more just like this is just a gigantic animal. It's not necessarily attacking out of malice, but it's huge and it's going to destroy everything. And how the hell do you stop it? And it's one of my favorite things about Godzilla movies in general is watching the military try to scramble to just like, all right, how do we stop this thing from even coming ashore? And even then, after Godzilla comes out of Mount Mihara, you have the uh, firefight in the Uraga Channel, which is might be one of my favorite special effect scenes in a Godzilla movie. Just for the smoke everywhere, the pyro that's being launched at Godzilla, the detailed ships that are firing at him. You have the best looking Godzilla suit in the entire franchise as far as I'm concerned. There's so much smoke surrounding him as the firefight goes on that you even see Godzilla use tactics of his own where he's using his atomic breath to create these huge geysers out of the water and uses that to almost clear the air of the smoke so that he can get a clean shot off at some of the ships. The VFX sequences in this movie are really great. Koichi Kawakita was the visual effects supervisor for this movie and he worked with Studio Ox, who did the effects for Gunhead. And I really do like the effects, especially Godzilla attacking the city is very atmospheric. And the Super X fight in here that follows when he's attacking the JSDF, I think that works a lot better than the Super X fight from Godzilla 1985. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's a lot more kinetic in how it's shot and how it's paced. I do love the original Super X, but it does just kind of hover there mostly, shoot out a flare, Godzilla roars and it shoots Godzilla with cadmium, and it happens a few times it's just kind of slow and repetitive. With the Super X2, they add the fire mirror to it so that it can at least reflect Godzilla's atomic breath. And that gives it a more fast pace. So now the Super X is this machine that's just trying to fly around, you know, maneuver it so that you can try to reflect Godzilla's atomic breath at him. And for a little while, it's successful. Not only that, but I didn't think about it until getting ready for this. I realized the Super X1 and the Super X3 were manned vehicles. The Super X2 was the only one that was remote controlled. Yeah, the Super X-2 is a drone. Yeah, exactly. It kind of foretold drones. There's an argument to be made that this movie really should be called Godzilla vs. Super X-2 because I feel like Super X-2 might have more screen time than Biolanti. It has more screen time, but I think Biolanti's presence is more impactful. That is true. And that's one of the things that I like, too, about the movie is you have Biolanti and she's this threat, certainly. She's kind of this more of an unknown the way we've been approaching it. But the movie is 100% about Godzilla. The first act of the movie 
movie is, oh no, he's waking up again, and we have to be prepared to stop him. The second act is, all right, Godzilla's come out of Mount Mihara, how do we stop this? And that pretty much fuels the rest of the movie. And it's one of my favorite things about any Godzilla movie. You just have the military trying to figure out what you can hit him with that'll at least slow him down. They even bring Asuka and Mickey out to this helicopter platform in the middle of the ocean to, like, look, he's about to reach Osaka, we need more time to evacuate. Is there anything you can do to stop him, or at least slow him down? And Miki, all the credit to her, she goes right after him in a little psychic duel, which is one of the most interesting things probably in the movie, just because it seems so out of left field in a way. It is almost like Friday the 13th where uh, Jason was fighting the psychic girl. For some reason, like in the late 80s, everybody had to fight a psychic girl at some point. Yeah, really, yeah. That was kind of a thing. Do you feel like Miki trying to take on Godzilla like that was kind of reckless on her part, considering how she was characterized later on in like Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah on? We're dealing with a younger version of her, so I think that the younger version of her wouldn't have any problem with trying to face her. I mean, she's going to do what she feels like she needs to do in the moment. I think that makes sense in that sense. And again, I just give all the credit in the world to Megumi Odaka for how she plays her. There's an intensity to her performance as Miki in this. Maybe it's because of how young she is at the time, compared to the later Heisei movies. She just seems a lot more focused, a lot more intense in Godzilla vs. Biollante than she does in later appearances. It's a really, really uh, neat performance. Yeah, she has a lot of angst to her, and she has a lot of charisma, even though they don't necessarily give her a lot to do, and you can see why she's somebody that they brought back. Which is funny, because the girl who played Eriko was Yasuko Sawaguchi, who is Naoko. They bring her back as a different person. That was her? Yes. Holy smoke, I didn't realize that. Maybe as a thank you, they brought her back as a different character. It does say something. They kept bringing back Miki with Megumi Odaka, because she does have a lot of charisma as that character. I also like the fact that Hana no Asuka Gumi, she looked like she was hell-bent for leather in that series, and then she's in the Godzilla series after that, and, you know, she's part of the UN. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I won't go into that. Yeah, she ends up becoming one of the most important characters kind of in the whole franchise, the more you think about it, with the exception of Return of Godzilla. She's there for the whole Heisei series. She's there from this all the way to Godzilla vs. Destroya. And sometimes the roles that she plays as Miki are reduced or whatever. She's kind of just there in Godzilla vs. Mothra, but there's always a little bit of continuity that she brings with her and a little bit of familiarity with Godzilla that she seems to carry with her especially after her uh, psychic duel with Godzilla. Yeah, she brings a lot of personality to the Godzilla series. A lot of people feel like Godzilla is the star. We don't need to have characters, you know, but like having Miki there really does gives a face other than Godzilla to the series. It's always a common complaint I see lobbied is people can't stand the human characters in the Godzilla movies. And I'm going to assume that these people have the minds of children because this movie made me appreciate the human characters more than I have before. They came across as pretty real people. We talked about uh, Kirishima and Asuka's relationship being very realistic for happening in a world with a giant monster coming out of a volcano and, a, and uh, a giant rose being born out of a lake. You need that human element because, all right, there's something to the idea of, say, there was the final issue of the Dark Horse Godzilla comic, the one that was written and drawn by Bob Eggleton, the great Bob Eggleton, where it's Godzilla wakes up and suddenly he's in prehistoric times. So there's no humans to speak of. It's just Godzilla in prehistoric times and ends up fighting a creature that he's never fought before. And it's very simple, but that's only going to carry us so far when it comes to a narrative. The shorts that have been coming out every year, what was it, they had the Godzilla vs. Hedra last year and Godzilla vs. Gigan short come out this year. There's some narration, but they don't show any human characters. It's just the monster fights. And I'm left feeling, yeah, all right, yeah, that, that, that was cool. It looked nice, but you want something of a bit more substance, or at least I want something with a bit more substance to it. With Godzilla vs. Biollante, I think the characters that you encounter here are all really great. I agree with you that Colonel Gondo is pretty much if you brought Bruce Willis into a Godzilla movie, and Kuroki is another character that I would have loved to have seen come back, but you need that human connection, otherwise all you've got is a pyrotechnic show. The monsters are the metaphors of the story. The human characters are kind of the heart. And I do like Colonel Gondo because he works in the Godzilla research Defense Department, and there hasn't been a Godzilla attack for five years, so he's just got nothing to do. And if you've ever been at work, you know it's cool to have nothing to do, but sometimes it can be more stressful pretending to work than actually working. 
tell me about it, dear God. I'm not saying I'm an actor of any sort, but I like to think that I've learned how to go and be a, at least a decent actor and just by being full of just enough shit. Gondo, he's got to sit at his desk. He's got to look like he's doing something important, even though there's no Godzilla activity. He's doing the George Costanza. I got to walk around looking stressed out all the time because that makes me look like I'm busy. <laughs> Oh, man. I never thought I'd hear about Colonel Gondo being compared to George Costanza. Jesus. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it, too. It's one of those things, too, where even, like, I feel the English dub performance for Colonel Gondo is really good. I think both the Japanese performance and the English dub, and it's the international English dub, those are usually a little shaky, but I feel like the actor that plays Colonel Gondo in the English dub really kind of gets that swagger across. You put it perfectly just with him making the comment about, honestly, I hope he shows up. It feels like action hero but at the same time you could see someone that's in that position saying that and meaning it and he really does have a lot of the emotion of the movie whereas like i feel like the other people with asuka and kirishima they're more of like the philosophical side of the story gondo to me really feels like he's the entry point into the story yeah kirishima and asuka that's the adult side of things colonel gondo represents a lot more of the stuff that people want to see in godzilla movies the action the mayhem that sort of thing and it's a testament i think to Godzilla vs. Biollante that out of all the Godzilla characters I've seen in these movies, Colonel Gondo is still one of my favorites out of the entire franchise. When he shoots Godzilla in the mouth with the rocket full of the anti-nuclear energy bacteria and I can never remember what he says in the Japanese version, but I always remember the dub because that was the one that I started off with back on VHS. He just gives that little quip there like, all this intravenous stuff's no good for you. Stick to smoking. And it's like, oh that's so fucking cool. Even then too the scene with uh, Gondo and Kirishima at the uh, exchange with the, the guy from Biomajor. They have that really well-crafted hostage situation. Japan's being threatened by Biomajor. Biomajor has put up a series of explosives around Mount Mihara, and if they go off, they're gonna free Godzilla. But they can go and turn off those bombs if Kirishima and Gondo give Biomajor the anti-nuclear energy bacteria. Then it won't go off, you won't have to deal with Godzilla. You just won't have any defense if Godzilla does happen to show up anyway. It's such a great no-win scenario, and it's so good for the drama of it. Again, it's one of those things where it falls under those scenes I enjoy of just how do you stop Godzilla? And you just feel his presence hanging over them the more they try to like, all right, we got to figure out what to do or, you know, no matter what we do, we're fucked. It's almost, it's saying like Godzilla is inevitable. It is, yeah. When, even when they shoot him full of that anti-Godzilla bacteria, it just gets him high, he passes out, and then he's okay again. Like their entire, like, <laughs> <laughs> like all this talk in the beginning about like, oh my God, the power we're going to have being able to kill Godzilla. It was all bullshit. They had no ability to stop him. They had to go and rely on an untested series of electrodes that they had to go and seed the sky with to create a thunderstorm and then use these electrodes to bring lightning down onto Godzilla to try and raise his temperature. It's another one of those really, really cool ideas that you'd come across for just like different devices and things like that. It's the same thing as like the Mazer units, stuff like that. The TC system is something that I would love to see come back in some capacity. There's a lot of really neat ideas in it. And that's the thing that really sets Biollante apart from the return of Godzilla and from a lot of other Godzilla. Godzilla movies in general is that it's filled with a lot of really cool ideas. And that's all you really want when it's a monster movie or a sci-fi movie. You want some really neat ideas that'll get your imagination going. But the cherry on top is the discussion about ethics. The discussion about are we going too far? Are we creating our own monsters? That's what I look for. And I feel like you only get that with the really good Japanese sci-fi movies and this is definitely one of them. What do you feel is the stronger fight? The the fight between Godzilla and Rose Biollante or the fight between Godzilla and monster form Biollante? They each have their strengths. I think it's when Godzilla's fighting monster of Biollante where he's getting impaled yeah. by the stalks. There's a lot of monster blood. It's probably the goriest fight in the entire Godzilla series. Yeah, the fights don't have any silliness to them. Like Godzilla versus King Ghidorah starts to go and bring that silliness back. And I love that movie, but it does start to bring some of that silliness in the monster battles back. This, they feel like friggin' animals, and they're doing serious 
fucking damage to each other. Like you said, Godzilla gets his hand impaled by one of the stalks and his shoulder run through by another one. Violante starts using her acid spit at him, and Godzilla's just covered in acid and smoking. Then Violante just moves up and just bites down on his head as hard as she can. <laughs> so in response to that, Godzilla just starts firing his atomic breath, fires it directly into her mouth, and blows out the back of her fucking head. <laughs> They never got to that level of brutality, really, in later Godzilla movies. It was just more, again, oh, sparks are going off, that's it. This felt like the monsters were hurting each other. Visually, it's so interesting. When you see that establishing shot where they're watching Godzilla and Biolanti, you can see how much bigger she is compared to him. Like, like the design of Biolanti is so cool. When I first saw that shot of monster Biolanti, she's like 120 meters and Godzilla's 80 meters. When I first saw that, I think it was like in middle school, and I saw that scene, my eyes just went wide, like, holy crap, I've never seen him dwarfed like this. There's so many great little compositional shots in there. Thank God for Blu-ray, re-watching this, I finally figured out how Biolanti moves, the monster form Biolanti, and it's hard to see. You can kind of make out these sort of, like, insectoid kind of legs coming out of the bottom, and they're kind of moving up and down, but you don't see it because you're so distracted by all the other vines and Biolanti's head moving like it does, and it just gives this whole new level of just monstrousness to it. I wish there was more Biolanti in the movie, but I feel like the reason there isn't is because the Biolanti suit was so hard to operate. The head of Biolanti is 10 feet, and then all the tentacles are on wires, and it was hard to choreograph the fights because the Godzilla suit actor, the late great Ken Pachiro Satsuma, he couldn't feel the tentacles when they were on him because the tentacles were on wires, so they had no weight to them. So I think they had a lot of challenges they had to overcome. That's one of the things that I give the movie the most credit for. The special effects team, I remember seeing something from one of those behind the scenes kind of deals where you see the crew and they're about to go and do the first shot of Violante moving on her own, monster form Violante. And after they are able to pull it off, you can hear someone's like, oh wow, you know, the Sugoi. And I don't blame them for being awestruck by it. It still is an impressive, impressive effect even today. Do you tend to go and enjoy the Godzilla movies that are more grounded like this one? Or do you like the ones that kind of go more balls to the wall? For the most part, I like when shit is ridiculous and crazy, but I also like when there's real emotion in things. I do like the fact that there is a lot of emotion in this movie. It is a story about like, loss. Yeah, loss and how you deal with your offspring in a sense because you have that idea with the doctor and his daughter, but then there's also Godzilla and Biolanti. Biolanti is an offshoot of Godzilla, and so how do they relate to each other? Yeah, and again they even that they go and point out, they're not brother and sister, they're the same creature. It's almost as if Godzilla's instinct to destroy is projected onto Godzilla through Biolanti. It almost seems as if Biolanti's instinct is to destroy Godzilla. Do you think that might have been why she was calling to him when she was is it still in that rose form in Lake Ashinoko after he emerged from Mount Mihara? I suppose. I think that makes the most sense because the only other consciousness in Biolanti is Erika. So, like, I mean, what would she do other than fight Godzilla? <laughs> yeah, you know? When I first saw the movie, I felt like there was no, like, who do you root for? Because they're both villains. And then the more I watched it, the more I felt like, no, Biolanti is the hero. Godzilla is the villain of the story. Even though he's not malevolent, Godzilla is still this unstoppable force of destruction where he just destroys Biolanti was the one thing standing in the way. Yeah, the perspective you're giving me is really neat because I never really thought of it like that. Even watching it this time, I suppose I was paying more attention to the human characters than I was to the motivations of the monsters. The idea of seeing Biolanti as the hero is a really neat idea. It certainly changes the movie around and gives it a different complexion when I look back at it now. No, when I originally, I mean, even re-watching it here, I was thinking you're rooting for the human characters, certainly, but when it comes to the monsters, yeah, no, I, I really ended up just seeing them both as just like wild animals more than Biolanti being guided by Erica's spirit. So final thoughts. What are your final thoughts on Godzilla versus Biolanti? It's still one of my all-time favorite Godzilla movies. This one is definitely top five. It's a really good introductory Godzilla movie. It tells you everything you need to know that happened in Godzilla 1985 or Return of Godzilla, whichever one you want to call it. And you could just jump right into it. For the most part, it's about as perfect a Godzilla movie as you can get. 